Welcome to Australia, the story of us. September 20, 1944, New York City. Laurie Hartnett arrives at General Motors headquarters. He's about to make the pitch of a lifetime. If successful, he'll create something that millions of Australians will own and love and transform the way we move about our continent. Hartnett heads up the small General Motors subsidiary in Australia. He's been rehearsing for this meeting for months and he knows his chances of success are almost zero. This is the board of General Motors, the top brass of the world's biggest corporation. Now, gentlemen, if I may have your attention, please. Australia's post-war prosperity rides on the outcome of this one meeting. I knew that whether their decision was yes or no now depended on me. I felt the burden of responsibility very keenly. You all know my failings on budget constraint. General Motors chairman, Alfred P. Sloan, not to be messed with. I want costs contained. GM has car assembly plants in Australia, but Sloan is skeptical about the future of the Australian business. We'll assemble the vehicles in Detroit and have them shipped out to Australia fully built. The fate of Australian manufacturing and tens of thousands of jobs are in jeopardy unless Laurie Hartnett can change minds today. They won't have a problem with that. Moving on. I do, sir. It's the dying days of the Second World War. In Australia, factories have been churning out guns, planes and ammunition for the front line. It's a highly skilled, efficient workforce that could soon be unemployed. Hartnett's idea is to retool the munitions plants into car production lines. I would like to design and manufacture a brand new car. An Australian car for Australian conditions. Uh, uh, Mr. Hartnett, I'm looking to reduce costs. They're talking about a massive expansion program. No, no, son, it's never gonna happen. Well, let me tell you why it will. What the GM bosses in New York don't know is that Hartnett's Australian team has been working on a secret concept car for months. They call it Project 2000. In the 1940s, ordinary Australians aren't buying cars. They're too expensive. We live close to our workplaces and catch trams and buses. Milk and bread are delivered groceries bought at the corner shop. Hartnett believes we need an affordable car. Rugged enough to withstand Australian conditions and comfortable enough over our long distances. He's worked out everything from engine size to seat colour to door handles. We have fully operational foundries that produce the highest quality steel at the lowest possible price in the world. The Americans have little idea about Australia. Most believe we all live on sheep ranches. We live in cities and towns, but it's a big country and we travel vast distances. We need a good car. What's wrong with Chrysler? Too big, too grand too low. Big American cars guzzle gas and fuel in Australia is expensive. What about the British Vauxhall? Too puny and underpowered. So you see there is a gap in the market. So what's this venture going to cost us? Well to get the whole operation up and running sir. 
three million pounds. <laughs> In today's money, it's a two billion dollar proposition. Alfred P. Sloan stared ahead thoughtfully. The other members doodled on their pads. No one spoke for a full minute. If you ask me, I think it makes damn good horse sense. To Hartnett's amazement, the chairman gives him the green light. But there are conditions attached, and they're big ones. The car must be based on a General Motors prototype. The US company also refuses to contribute a cent. Hartnett must raise the money himself. He turns to Australian Prime Minister Ben Chifley. Chifley shares Hartnett's enthusiasm for an Australian-made car. Chifley wanted Australians to be involved in manufacturing. He wanted them to be proud and he wanted an Australian car. Chifley convinces the banks to lend the money. And Australia's first mass-produced car takes shape in Melbourne. General Motors contracts hundreds of companies to build parts. Australian manufacturing booms. Back in Victoria, everything is ready for final assembly. From now on, it moves at two feet each minute. The price tag, £733, or $38,000 in today's money. About two years' wages for the average earner. The first car has reached the end of the production line. The job is done and an Australian car is born. The Holden, when it rolled off the assembly line, was a sort of automotive far lap. And uh, it was extremely glamorous to own one. The nation embraces the FX Holden. Within three years, production is up to 100 cars per day. At this volume, costs come down. All the family, take the wheel. This is the year of the million Poland, and this is the million Poland. Just as Hartnett calculated, even average working families can afford a hold. In our expanding suburbs, cars deliver the Australian dream. The car completely transformed Australian way of life because once the typical working family in Australia could afford a car, that meant they had this incredible freedom. You beauty, I'm out of here. It was freedom. I mean, I think that's the only way to describe your first car, escapism, and I've got independence now. To create Australia's heavy manufacturing industry, Laurie Hartnett put his reputation and $2 billion on the line. But it pays off. Laurie Hartman gives us our iconic Australian car. In 1967, he's knighted for his services to Australian industry. The nation's post-war boom is away and running, and it's about to be turbocharged.